Now, you might have come across this man, Jay Smith, or perhaps this man, Dan Gibson, or perhaps this dude, Fadi. If you have, you'll likely be aware of their crazy conspiracies around the origins of Islam. Here's a taste of the sort of gems they peddle to their audience. Refer to Gibson's material again, his research on all these mosques that were built as far away as Guangzhou in China and Sherman in India. And you, you have mosques that are built in Turkey and in Jordan and in Syria and especially in Israel. And they're all facing possibly Petra. And this is in case you switched off in the face of the obvious BS. People like Jay Smith allege Mecca, the town where the Prophet ﷺ was born and spent 53 years of his life, apparently didn't exist at the time the Prophet was alive. Hundreds, 1500s, and 1600s, and we showed that every one of these maps, there was one glaring, uh, the one glaring thing that was missing, and that was Mecca. It was not on any of these maps. But Ptolemy knew nothing about Mecca. So and if that wasn't bonkers enough, the Quran wasn't even written in Mecca and the Hijaz. Get this. But over 800 miles north, in a city called Petra, modern-day Jordan. It has olive trees. There are no olive trees anywhere that far south. They're all up in the Mediterranean world. And then it refers 23 times to these people from Ad. Well, Ad is Uz in the Bible. Where is Ad? It's way up in Nabatea. It's up near Petra. It talked 24 times about these people from Thamud. That is Nabataeans. The Thamudians are the Nabataeans, as we know it in the Bible. That's all around Jordan, 600 miles further north. And then seven times it refers to these people from Midian that this prophet has contact with, daily contact with. You can't have daily contact with people that are 600 miles further north. Obviously, there's something wrong that the geography that's in the Quran just does not make sense. And so Gibson brought this up and he wrote a book on it. It really is enough to make your cat roll on the floor and laugh itself to death, isn't it? Well, you need to have one first. Now, I needn't say, people like Jay Smith and Fardy aren't bona fide academics who've actually spent any real time studying the subjects they pretend they're experts on. They talk with authority and put on a good PowerPoint presentation, which gives everyone the impression they know what they're talking about. But as I will show you in this video, academics, they are certainly not. And that's where their conspiracy theories ought to really end. Now, this gentleman here is actually a real world-class academic who's spent many years learning his craft. Professor Ahmed El Jalat is a philologist, epigraphist, and historian of language. His work focuses on the languages and writing systems of pre-Islamic Arabia and the ancient Near East, and these are his bona fides. He's a master's and PhD graduate at Harvard, a published author and a rising star in the field. Now, it might get a little technical, but I want you to really pay attention to what he's saying, because unlike amateur Jay Smith and his highly qualified team of search engine operators, not only is this individual a trained academic, but he spends most of his time doing fieldwork in Saudi Arabia, literally deciphering ancient rock inscriptions to see how the Arabic script has evolved over hundreds of years. Now, bear in mind the ridiculous allegation. Islam didn't begin in Mecca and the Hijaz. So let's now see how J. Smith's theory measures up to real scholarship. And our recent surveys, so Haytham Sidqi and I have carried out two seasons of surveys in the Mecca Bayev area. We were able to document a number of new Paleo-Arabic inscriptions. The first so let's be clear. Mr. Jalad is telling us that he has surveyed rock inscriptions in the Mecca Taif region, the very location where Muhammad's ministry began. So we're literally studying ancient rocks in the epicenter of Islam. Note, we're talking about primary sources here, the gold standard of the historical critical method. It's fascinating. It's the inscriptions that we documented from the, air, the, the, the area of Mecca Bayer. These inscriptions are, uh, have orthographic peculiarities that distinguish them from, uh, from the inscriptions of other parts of the Arabian Peninsula. So his research has uncovered that the pre-Islamic Paleo-Arabic scripts differ depending on location. So, for example, Mecca has one Arabic script, while the Najd has a different one, and so on. But there are inscriptions from the Hejaz around Tabuk and south of Tabuk, on the, between Tabuk and Medina. 
And these inscriptions use sort of the same kind of vocabulary, but they invoke a god called Allah. And they spell his name Alif Lam Ha, or just Lam Ha, or Ya Lam Ha if it's an Ibafa. To demonstrate his point, here he's just focusing on the spelling of the word Allah. He tells us that in the region between Tabuk, which is 424 miles north of Medina, and Medina itself, the rock inscriptions show the spelling of Allah as Alif Lam Ha, or Lam Ha. Which is the Nabataean spelling of the name Allah, right? So in Petra, which was the capital city of the Nabataeans, remember the place J. Smith would absolutely love you to believe Islam started, they spell Allah with Alif Lam Ha. Please bear this in mind, it's crucial to today's discussion. Now, the professor is going to tell us how the word Allah is spelt in the text of the Holy Quran. And this is where it gets utterly fascinating. What's interesting about this is the spelling of Allah in the Quran then looks very different from the way we get it in the epigraphic map, right. right? Because in the Quran it's spelled Alif Lam Lam Ha. That's a peculiar way of spelling Allah, and it's not the intuitive way of spelling the name of Allah, since you don't usually represent the double consonant twice with the same consonant in the Semitic scripts. So the Quran looks different from the inscriptions from Tabu. It looks different from the inscriptions from, uh, from uh, Dumat al Jandal, from Najran, from Jordan and Syria. Subhanallah. So in the Quran, it's spelt with Alif, Lam, Lam, Ha. But what's important to note is the spelling of the Qur'an is peculiar and different to the spellings in other places like Tabuk, Najran, Jordan or Syria. Everywhere else it is spelt Alif Lam Ha, but in the Qur'an it's Alif Lam Lam Ha. Right, I guess that's the first nail in J. Smith's Petra conspiracy coffin. The orthographic evidence taken from ancient rocks around Petra objectively proves that the Qur'an could not have been written all the way up in Petra or anywhere around that Jordan, Syria, formerly Nabataean region because if it was, the word Allah would have been spelt with Alif, Lam, Ha. So, in terms of the first part of J. Smith's theory, when he asserts the Qur'an was inscribed on vellum in Petra, he has been proven paleographically and orthographically wrong. Hmm. So, now you might say, if the Qur'an wasn't created in Petra, if we continue to follow the evidence, where do we find it was written? You see, now it gets really interesting. But... In our documentation of the inscriptions from around Pai of Mecca, we find the exact spelling of Allah's name as we get in the Quran. Mm -hmm. It is spelled Alif Lam Lam Ha, which suggests that the scribal background of the Quran, right, this orthographic practice in the scribal background comes from this the area of the, this part of the Hijaz, right? This is the only place that we've discovered so far that's using this, this particular spelling of Allah. And it is something that these mm. pre-Islamic uh, Paleo-Arabic inscriptions share with the Quran. Now, wow, just wow. So the peculiar spelling of Allah spelt as Alif Lam Lam Ha found in the Quranic Mus'haf, according to Ahmed Al-Jalad's specialist fieldwork, corresponds exactly, exactly with the spelling of Allah as found in the pre-Islamic inscriptions of the Mecca Taif region. The Qur'an and the Meccan rocks are a perfect orthographic match. Oh, who would have guessed it? So, what does this mean? Well, it means the Qur'an could only have been committed to writing in the Meccan region of Hijaz, subhanAllah, as attested by the standard Muslim narrative. And this is the second major nail in J. Smith and Fadi's Petra was Mecca coffin. So let's quickly recap what the evidence is telling us. First, the Quran could not have been written in Petra or Najd or Tabuk or anywhere else for that matter. Secondly, it could only have been written in Mecca. And perhaps most painfully of all, well, for the doubters anyway, science and objective research has once again corroborated 
the 1400-year-old Muslim version of events. The Qur'an was indeed written down in Mecca. And, frankly, what else is there to add? As they say in the courts, the case is closed. In historical criticism, it really doesn't get more damning than primary sources. Books written many years after the fact, even memories, can fade. But inscriptions left by people from history gives modern scholars an unfiltered insight into the past. So, we come full circle. What does this mean for Dawa in general? Well, it means the standard Muslim narrative has been objectively substantiated and is more robust than many critics would like to admit. But they'll get there, slowly, I'm sure. As for amateur J. Smith and his crack team of Google operators, well, after some humble pie, they ought to be taking a long, hard look in the mirror. For how many years now has this shameless team knowingly orchestrated this absurd Petra was actually Mecca disinformation campaign when it wouldn't even pass the most rudimentary of academic smell tests? He knows it. Fadi knows it. I'm pretty sure behind the scenes they regularly pinch each other. They can't believe how gullible their audience is and how they're still getting away with it. I'm not surprised when you have channels like theirs dedicated to misinforming the audience, making everyone, I'm sorry to say, less intelligent. And this is what you end up with. Charlatans parading as experts, peddling hoaxes on dedicated channels of disinformation. I know, that's quite harsh, but sometimes you just have to call it out for what it is. Will this latest scholarship make any difference? I doubt it. And now I'm praying for my cat to come back to life. Anyway, let's leave it there for today. Let me know in the comments what you think of today's video. I always look forward to reading your response. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.